After some much-needed rest and humdrumming around the antique shop for a few days, Wanda finally screwed up the courage to call Darren. After some careful thought, she decided the best course of action was to be apologetic if Darren thought their relationship revolved around sex, but to reassert her boundaries that she just wasn't a move-in sort of girl. He would respect that. She pulled out her new phone. Thankfully, her cell phone company had everything saved on a private server, so when she'd bought a new one, she simply downloaded all of her stuff onto it. It suddenly rang in her hand, startling her. It was a number she didn't recognize. Wanda Summers, Antiques, Collectibles, and Curiosities, she said with gusto. Hey, Wanda, it's me. It was Darren. Speak of the devil, she laughed. I was just about to call you. You're already back from L.A., right? She leaned conversationally on the counter. Only for a few days, he said a little glumly. Oh, we should get together then. If you're working hard, you deserve a dinner out to relax. My treat, she said. I... I don't think so, he said slowly. What's the matter? Wanda, I've been thinking, and... Uh, the pause was torturous. I don't think I'm coming back from L.A. Wanda slowly sat on the stool behind the counter. What about me? She said softly. I love you. Darren said. I do, but I think we want two different things, and it's not fair for me to put my life and career on hold, waiting for you to catch up. He sounded resolute, like he'd rehearsed what he was saying, which he probably had. I mean, my career is moving forward, and there might even be a movie role in it for me in the near future. My agent is already hooking me up with a commercial or two instead of just magazine ads and billboards. Is this... Is this all about me not wanting to stay the night? Wanda whispered, already feeling the surge of tears coming. No, it's about me, Darren said slowly. I think you're always going to be happy with the way things are. Dating, sex, friends, blackout night, he listed off. But I want more. I want a wife and a family and... He trailed off. And you can't give me that. You won't. After two years, you won't move in with me or take that next step. I've been eyeing wedding rings for months, Wanda, but I think I already knew it wasn't going to happen. Wanda felt the words like a punch in the gut. She couldn't find anything to say. I'm moving to L.A. to chase after my dreams and career, and I'm leaving you, he said finally. She said nothing, the lump rising fast in her throat. Besides, I can't ask you to give up your dad's shop, and you can't ask me not to try and become a movie star, right? Oh, God. Wanda whispered, slowly resting her face in her hand. Dare and I. Goodbye, Wanda. His voice had cracked, and he quickly hung up. The line went dead. Wanda slowly set her phone on the counter, drawing her knees together and burying her face in her hands. She sat in silence for a long time, hot tears going down her face. She slowly leaned forward and rested her face in her arms atop the countertop. The drive home was a long and lonely one. When she got home, Aiko looked up from her laptop when Jasmine poke poked her shoulder. Her two friends stared at her. Um, was all Aiko could put in. J Darren was all Wanda could say, snuffling a little. Oh, Jasmine said, pulling her to the couch to hug her. He dumped you. Yeah. Wanda managed, holding her head in her hands. I've got three emergency pints of deep chocolate fudge ice cream, Jasmine said dutifully, getting up to go and get them. She came back with the trio of pints, passing them around. They ate in silence for a time, but Wanda's heart just wasn't in it. I think I need some air, Wanda said, setting her pint on the coffee table. I'm going to go for a drive, I think. It's already dark, Aiko said. I'll be fine, Wanda said. No, you won't, Aiko said. 
Wanda didn't answer, but rebelliously got her keys and thanked Jasmine for thinking of her with the ice cream. Jasmine made her take the pint with her, spoon and all, with a pile of paper towels. Wanda drove away with the windows down, the early summer air brushing her hair as she went. Well, that was a long time coming. Aiko mused when Wanda was gone. What? Jasmine said. You said it yourself. He wanted a relationship and she wanted a fuck buddy. Don't say it like that. It doesn't make her a bad person, Jasmine said defensively. I didn't say it did, Ego frowned. You made it sound bad. Sorry. Ego returned to her recliner when Jasmine took back the other two ice cream pints to the freezer. This from the girl who's never brought a man home in the ten years I've known her, Jasmine grumped, returning to the couch and picking up the TV remote. You do know I'm gay, right? Aiko said slowly. Jasmine stared at her. There was a long silence. You're joking. You never noticed. You've never brought home any women either. Jasmine snapped, folding her arms at her. You've never once showed interest in anyone I've ever seen. Ugh, this isn't about you. Wanda's hurting. And you could have told me way sooner. It's her own fault for leading him on for two years. Aiko shrugged, ignoring Jasmine's comments and Jasmine's finger pointed at her face. Some guys like commitment, but Wanda's not the committing kind. I swear to God, if you give me the strong, independent woman that don't need no man argument, I'ma punch you, Jasmine scowled. I wasn't going to, Aiko said flatly, tapping away at her keyboard. There was a long silence of her typing. Jasmine sat on the couch nearby and fidgeted, looking at her sideways. Aiko glanced at her more than once, eyeing her staring. She knew that look. Whenever somebody found out she was gay, she always heard the same question. That was why she'd never brought it up with her blonde friend. Wanda had figured it out years ago and had politely never brought it up. Go on and ask, she said with a roll of her eyes. Am I hot to you? Jasmine burned to know. No, Aiko said. Jasmine deflated like a kicked puppy. The tiny Japanese woman sighed at her friend. You're not my type, she amended. That didn't seem to help very much. Well, I'm straight, so you're lost. Jasmine stuck out her tongue and stormed out of the room. Aiko rolled her eyes and returned to her work with a slow shake of her head. All her friends were crazy, all of them. Jasmine was an idiot, but she was Aiko and Wanda's idiot most of the time. She had her moments. Aiko sighed mostly to herself. This is why she didn't date friends and why she'd never made a pass at Wanda. Complicating a friendship for a slim chance at romance never ended well. Sexy broad shoulders or not, she had other avenues to explore. Aiko watched $600,000 move from a winter wear company to a swimwear company. Summer was coming, so all the profits were moving. Three percent of it went to a sock company who promised in writing to donate a truckload of socks to a battered women's shelter in Maine and a trio of homeless shelters in central Kentucky. Socks, for some reason, were the most needed item when it came to caring for the homeless. It took Jasmine all of five minutes to come rushing back to Aiko to apologize for her your loss comment. Aiko gave forgiveness and awkward hugs while her friend squeezed her around the middle. Meanwhile, Wanda was driving across the city. She hurt, yes, but it felt like a bit of pressure had been relieved, really. Maybe Darren had been right. She'd been a little stressed about moving things forward with him for a very, very long time, but now it just hurt to think about. Had she just been using him as friends with benefits? She didn't have to date someone with the intention to marry, did she? Two years was a long time, though. Had she been leading him along when he expected some kind of happily ever after? Her head spun with questions. Wanda didn't go to her shop. It was past store hours. She didn't feel like the gym, either. Too many roosters there trying to impress her with their muscles. She didn't want to go to a bar and get hit on, and she didn't feel like dancing at a club. She stopped at a park to enjoy the sound of crickets and silence. She rolled down the window, parking under a lamp pole. 
Sighing long and loud, she rested her head on her hand and her elbow on the lip of the window. She sat there for a long time before pawing around in the darkness for her ice cream. Getting it out of the cup holder, she had only a couple of bites before she set it aside again. She turned on the radio but only got through three songs before shutting it off again. She rested her forehead on the steering wheel, muttering miserably to herself. Freshly single, for the first time in a long time. It hurt. It would be hard to move on from a handsome male model that loved you and made you laugh and held you close when it mattered and gave you chocolate when you were on your period and... <sighs> she sighed again. She looked in the sun visor mirror. Oh yes, the puffy-eyed sad girl look was very attractive. She swatted it back up in the closed position. Her phone buzzed with a text. She ignored it. She didn't want to talk to anyone right now. Wanda Summers! The robotic voice made Wanda squeal and flinch so hard she tore the steering wheel right off of its column with a splinter of metal. Son of a bitch! She shrieked angrily, wheeling towards the open window. Laser Wolf was squatting next to her van, staring at her. Where did you come from? She looked down at what she'd done. Look what you made me do! There was a short silence as he stared at the steering wheel in her hands. An intrusive blue light scanned over her and she glowered at him. You are 17% stronger than previously estimated. Updating data banks. Please exit the vehicle. I don't want to exit the vehicle. I want to sit here and be miserable for a while. Go away. She threw the steering wheel into her passenger seat. I just bought this van. I will fix it. Please exit the vehicle. Laser Wolf repeated. Wanda grumbled to herself, opening the door. She would not take her grief out on Laser Wolf. She reminded herself over and over. She was a superhero. She was a professional. She was just unhappy. She folded her arms at him with a frown. One second. No one needs to see me in my civilian clothes talking superhero stuff. She went around the back to get into the van and change. And don't peek, she said. Laser Wolf leaned to reach and grab the broken steering wheel. He studied the underside. A very clean break. She'd truly been caught off guard. After a minute or so of soldering, using one of his fingers, melting the plastic and marrying parts, it was almost as good as new. Reaching with a massive hand, he used one finger to test the turn signal one way and then the other. By then, Shield Maiden had emerged from the back of the van and he gently shut the door. What is it, big guy? She folded her arms at him, still frowning. I've had a bad day and I'm not sure I'm up for adventure right now. I am tracking Anubis, he told her plainly. Her instant, guilty expression tipped him off. You know where he is. I caught him a little while ago, Shield Maiden admitted. There is no record of him in Metacreature Prison. Laser Wolf wanted to know why. Where is he being held now? Data not found, Shield Maiden said with a pleading, coy smile. Do not lie to me. Laser Wolf's voice actually growled a little. His ears rotated backward and his visor darkened. Wow, he could actually emote a little bit. That was unusual. She'd never seen that before. I have him someplace safe. He's sick. He's being worked on. She told him, turning to walk from the van in case there were any onlookers. Worked on by whom? For what purpose? Laser Wolf followed her closely, his eyes flicker flashing as he spoke. Shield Maiden winced a little. Data not found. She moaned a little, face palming. She was getting worse and worse at this. Please stop asking questions. Anubis is dangerous. He must be contained and brought to Metacreature Prison, Laser Wolf said. He is contained, but it's not that simple. Why is it not that simple? He's very sick. Shield Maiden repeated, I don't think he's completely responsible for the way he is. Elaborate! Laser Wolf commanded as they walked along a sidewalk path. No one was in the park. It was already after dark. It was just the two of them. 
imagine if you were dying and the only thing that could keep you alive was drinking gasoline. Would you do it? She asked him. Yes, he said after a few moments of thought. Well, imagine if you were very sick and the only way to stay alive was to practice death magic. Shield Maiden said, not looking at him. Would you still do it? I do not know magic. Explain, Laser Wolf said. All those things he was breaking off those frozen corpses. I think he was making medicine and other things to keep himself alive. My benefactor is... Oh, shit. She cut herself off, wincing. You are not acting alone, Laser Wolf said robotically. Who is this benefactor? He studied her miserable face. She fell silent for a long time as they walked. Conjecture suggests that you have taken Anubis to a powerful magic user. The symbols on the front and back of your shield are alchemical. This stands to reason that your benefactor endowed you with your superpowers through magic. Further conjecture suggests that the same entity now works to cure Anubis. Is this correct? He wanted to know. When she didn't answer, the same annoying blue light scanned her profile as they walked together. Wanda did not have a poker face. Stop that! She shrieked angrily. Stop reading me! She turned to shove his shoulder a little. The light went away. To her surprise, Laser Wolf had to compensate his massive weight to not actually get shoved over. Her phone buzzed again in her little hip pouch. She ignored it. She was too upset right now. All of her secrets were spilling out. Anubis is very dangerous, Laser Wolf said. I must take him to Metacreature Prison while he is still incapacitated by your benefactor. Take me to him. I... I can't, Shield Maiden said, scratching her arm and looking at the sidewalk. There are... there are rules. I can't take you to where he is. It's secret. When he said nothing, she added, You know, we attacked him first. He's just a scavenger, not an evil supervillain. Why do you defend him? Laser Wolf said. Because he deserves the chance to be without whatever is making him the way he is. It could be cancer or AIDS or leukemia, she listed off. We don't know. Whatever it is, he was willing to use some really nasty magic to stay alive. Can your benefactor cure cancer? Laser Wolf wanted to know. Those are just examples, she said. But whatever it is, it must be really bad. Shield Maiden sighed sympathetically. When she really spelled it out, it sounded so sad. You are peeling off Anubis's magic to see what sickness lies beneath. That makes him a potent biohazard atop his dangerous magics. Laser Wolf decided, stopping and turning to her. This is no longer a debate. Take me to him, he commanded. Shield Maiden's eyes narrowed, and she stopped too. I'm sorry, big guy. I missed the part where you became the boss of me, she whispered, staring into his face. There was a short silence. Laser Wolf's eyes flicker flashed for a few moments. He was accessing something in his databanks. A few projectors hidden on his breastplate splashed the Lord Dragon article onto the sidewalk. Then the Ten Ton Gun Shogun article. Then next to those, all the other Shield Maiden articles that had been in the newspaper. Then, however, a picture of Wanda Summers' driver's license. Shield Maiden blinked a little. Then her birth certificate, her address and phone number, her high school graduation picture, parking tickets. Shield Maiden took a step back in horror. A picture from Jasmine's social media page was showing Wanda, herself, and Aiko at a bar, smiling ear to ear. A picture of Wanda in lewd attire that could have only come from Darren's cell phone. It all flashed out of existence. The message was clear. I will send this data package everywhere, Laser Wolf said clinically. She stared at him in disbelief. Everywhere, he repeated. As though to punctuate, a tiny transmitter dish popped out from one of his shoulders, pointing skyward. 
Shield Maiden stared at Laserwolf, a little open-mouthed. But, but you can't do that, she protested. You said you wouldn't tell anyone who I was. You are harboring a criminal, Laserwolf insisted. Make your choice. They stared at each other for a long, long time. Shield Maiden's mouth was dry. What could she do? Her phone buzzed in her pouch a third time. Not taking her eyes off him, she unclipped her pouch and got it out. Three new texts. She held it up. Anubis is a cage, the first one said. It is loose, the second one said. H-E-L. Was it supposed to say help? That was the last message. Shield Maiden frowned. Something's wrong, she said. Make your choice. Laser Wolf would not be distracted. Can you carry me? I can't fly. Shield Maiden put her fists on her hips, scowling at him. I can, he said with no hesitation. Well, I guess I'm bringing you home then, she said. Hope you're happy. What has happened? My benefactor is asking for help. And she doesn't ask for help. Shield Maiden came forward so he would pick her up. He awkwardly tried to put her over his shoulder with her butt resting against the side of his face. Not like that, you idiot! She squirmed and swatted at him. Like this! She settled into a bridal-style position. Now just don't drop me, she said as his jetpack deployed and began to ignite. Begrudgingly, she gave him the secret address. Shield Maiden and Laser Wolf emerged into the atrium at the home of the benefactor. Instantly, there was a skittering in the dark. Shield Maiden held up a hand. Spiders. Spiders everywhere, the mechanical ones with bronze needles for legs drooling white goop from their mechanical mouths. They were shining in the half-light, all gears and sharp points and black metal paneling. Laser Wolf's arm cannons deployed and he pointed them this way and that as they closed in around them. Shield Maiden smirked a little, walking forward. The crowd of little mechanical monsters parted for her. Laser Wolf tried to do the same thing and follow in her wake and was instantly set upon, dozens of them spitting and shrieking and crawling up his legs. A mechanical roar sounded, his lasers blasting back and forth. They shattered into millions of pieces only to roll this way and that to form new little bronze bodies and continue their onslaught. Arcs of blue heat and light went this way and that. Tell them a secret, Shield Maiden said, leaning against the archway. She watched him struggle for a time before he finally seemed to regain his poise and stand stock still. They crawled all over him until she almost couldn't see him anymore. Tell them a secret, something you've never told anyone, she shouted again. They'll leave you alone. Laser Wolf's pilot is female. Laser Wolf Char growled, his voice box skipping a little. The spiders parted, leaving a spattered mess underneath. They retreated into darkness behind pillars and into hidden little corners to wait for more prey that didn't understand the trick. Shield Maiden stared as he clanked forward, tearing at the masses of webbing and acid-touched metal. Well, she. She clanked forward. You're a woman? she asked curiously. Yes. The voice was robotic and male. It was a perfect disguise, really, Shield Maiden thought. The newspapers thought Laser Wolf was a robot. Shield Maiden knew there was a pilot in there, and now... a woman. She'd never even suspected. Huh. Shield Maiden put a hand on her hip. Voice modulation is a simple task. Let us move forward. Laser Wolf dismissed the revelation and would not allow her to dwell on it. What were those? Secret spiders, Shield Maiden said, peeling off her mask as they went. Part of my benefactor's security system. A very small part. If she's left them out, then something must be wrong. They crossed the atrium and into the large stone halls. This room's dimensions do not match the structure outside, Laser Wolf observed. 
It's magic, Shield Maiden shrugged. I try not to think too hard about it when I'm here. That is foolish. Shut up, she snapped. Anubis should be in the rounded cell at the end of the hall. She turned sharply. Hello, she called. It's Wanda. Hello? She called. Her voice echoed and there was no response. Uh-oh. She stopped. A trio of columns in the grand hall were damaged. Bits of rock and debris were scattered everywhere. The door to Anubis's cell had been blown out and shattered into shards of broken metal, some of them sticking out of the wall and floor. The archway had been broken out by something large, very large. Laser Wolf scanned here and there, but followed Wanda very closely. A secret spider clambered here or there, minding its own business. Wanda hefted her shield just a little, in case something should come springing out of the darker corners or rooms. Her foot touched a smartphone. She knelt down. There was a single drop of blood on the screen. It was still on the texting screen, showing the same text that Wanda had received earlier. She showed it to Laser Wolf. His shoulder cannons deployed and they whined as they warmed up for firing. Scans indicate that something with many legs burst from this room, Laser Wolf said, his head turning as he followed the path scratched into the marble floor. Large, heavy, many, many legs. Like one of the secret spiders? Dozens of legs, Laser Wolf amended. Great, Wanda whispered. How can this day get any worse? They arrived at the broken archway of Anubis's cell. It was dark and quiet. She fished into her leg pouch for a tiny flashlight, but Laser Wolf's eyes snapped into a blinding brightness, lighting the whole room. The box TV with bunny ears was lying on its side, broken. The rolling table was in pieces all over the floor. All of the benefactor's tools were scattered against the wall. There were slashing burn marks up and down the perfect stone walls. Wanda moved slowly around the slab, which was facing away from the door. Laser Wolf seemed to understand and went the other way. The ropes were in a pile on the floor, but there was still a figure there. Wanda's boot went into something squishy and flesh-like. She jumped back in revulsion when a spray of something gross went out from under her like a burst pimple. Laser's arms clack-clacked as his arm cannons deployed to join the shoulder cannons. They whirred to life, flashing blue. Shield Maiden slapped her mask back onto her face, not sure what else to do to prepare. Anubis lay on the slab, limp and lifeless. He looked dead. His ribs were starkly showing, and his whole body looked pale and sickly. Shield Maiden could see his tattoos under his fur, even from where she stood. He looked like a husk of his former self. He'd lost another foot of height since she'd seen him last. Laser Wolf's scanning light went up and down. Alive, he droned. Shield Maiden picked carefully among the blobs of flesh that were all over the floor in a huge spray from the slab itself. Something broke out of Anubis's body. Where is the exit wound? There isn't one. Shield Maiden ran her hands back and forth on him in case a tuft of fur was hiding a grievous wound. He's just been weakened. You saw him before. He was way taller and full of muscle. Your benefactor's message claimed that Anubis was a cage. A cage for what? Laser Wolf wanted to know. Shield Maiden turned and slowly looked around, then at the floor to all the lumps of torn flesh and piles of gore. Too much for one person. The benefactor wasn't dead. Where is she? She whispered. She would have heard us coming in. Laser Wolf leaned and, using the barrel of his arm cannon, lifted something up. It was sticky, fleshy, and you could almost see through it. A skin? Had something shed in here? He said nothing but held it up to show her. There were stark white ribs hanging off of it. Bits of slime and pus dripped wetly to the floor. What sort of creature shed skin and bones and bodily fluids like that? 
If the hallway's broken columns were any indication, it must have been enormous. There's something out there, Laser. Shield Maiden whispered, looking at the mess all around them. Something bad. There were noises in the hallway. To be continued.